Good afternoon and welcome to the Respectability webinar for Thursday, September 26, 2018. Um, thank you so much everyone who's joining us today. My name is Philip Khan Polly. I am the Policy and Practices Director for Respectability. As you should know, and I hope you know, and I hope you live and breathe and know it, we are an organization that is dedicated to fighting stigmas and advancing opportunities for people with disabilities. Uh, and that specific piece, that advancing opportunities piece, is what I'm going to be talking to you today because I'm going to be sharing some critical lessons about how to advocate your governor on the issue of jobs for people with disabilities. Um, I'm your presenter today, but I'm going to be joined very momentarily by an audio recording um, from the lovely Steve Bartlett, who is the co-author of the Americans with Disabilities Act, who is been a member of Congress, who's been a mayor of da the city, great city of Dallas. Um, he's going to share some practical insights in terms of what, he, um, what it takes to be a successful advocate, how to talk to your public officials, how to get engaged, how to get a positive response, and build that successful advocacy relationship, which will, in the end, affect policy, affect practices, and hopefully uh, translate to more jobs for people with disabilities. So up the slide today, I've got kind of our learning objectives. So we're going to listen um, to some wisdom from Steve Bartlett, and then we're going to pivot to talking about what specifically respectability wants governors to do. Then I'm going to talk about something called NDEAM. Uh, pop quiz for those who don't know what that term is, you're going to learn what it is today. It is short for National Disability Employment Awareness Month, which is October, and we're super excited. This year, as some of you may know, 343,000 new jobs for people with disabilities were created. That is a tremendous growth among a population that has struggled for years to gain a foothold in the economy, and it's because of alignment of a growing economy, best practices, workforce systems, and we are so delighted with the progress that our country is making on that piece. Um, and it's good to have some good news when there's so many other things going on. And after we talk about what we, we want to do with NDEAM, I'm going to lay out some very critical principles of you know, advocacy and how to talk to a governor and how to organize meetings and who to call and what to talk about. Um, then I'm going to talk about some other ways you can get involved with, and that's kind of our agenda for today. So joining us by previously recorded audio briefing, Steve Bartlett. Nice to meet you all by, by uh, webinar in any event. Uh, let me start with uh, I want to thank the people on this call for what you are doing and, more importantly, what you are about to do. Uh, because you, uh, across the country with grassroots help, you can make a huge difference in the understanding and the clarity and the knowledge base of both elected officials and candidates, and you will, you will move the needle. So this is a serious proposal, and it's, uh, it's, it can only be implemented by you, and thank you for that. Uh, my own role is I, I've been in elected office three times. Uh, I was a Dallas City Councilman for an at-large seat in the city of Dallas. I was a member of the U.S. Congress representing Dallas for eight years, and I was mayor, mayor of Dallas. And in that, uh, the life of an elected official is a public life, and, and so you need to know that. Um, the member, uh, elected officials, whether it's school board or legislators or congressmen or mayors or city council, they, they really do uh, get a joy from hearing from their constituents and learning. So. This is not something that they will they will resist. This is something that they will want to. The elected officials will actually want to hear from you because they learned something uh, something from it. Uh, I, when I was in Congress, I had 18 public town halls every year. Uh, when I was mayor, I had uh, 60 or so public hearings uh, every year. When I was a city councilman, I had 12 um, uh, town halls uh, every year. And uh, getting people to come to those town halls was. Uh, I, I had town halls in which only three people showed up, and I had town halls in which 250, and it kind of depends on what's happening in the in the public at the at the time. So, for you to go, to go to one, to an event will really make a difference. So let me I'm going to walk through some how to, um, and then I, I and then and then I'll turn it back over to Philip, and then we'll be able to take questions at the end. First, what you say does matter. The information that you transmit and the way you transmit it will will affect the thinking of an elected official. You, now, you can't ask for an elected official to just simply hear what you have to say and say, okay, you're so smart, I'll just agree with you and I'll do it the way you say it. Uh, so what you're really looking for is a greater understanding of uh, stigmatizing of jobs, of job opportunities, of independence for disability. You're, you're looking for a better understanding on their part than they might have had in the beginning. So you take every elected official kind of wherever they are and you begin to develop that uh, under, understanding. So what you say does matter, it will change the, uh, the mindset of elected officials all over the country. More importantly, 
what you don't say also matters, Means meaning that the only people that get heard in a democracy are the people that speak up. So if we don't speak up, then we don't get heard, and our side of the story of independence just never never gets told. So here's how you do it. Uh, first of all, you look, and I'll give you some suggestions. You put yourself in front of an elected official, uh, and there are several places to get, be in front of them, but you want to be in front of them. You want to, to, uh, you want to have a as close to a personal relationship as you can in terms of communicating to where they see they see you, they hear what you have to say, and they uh, then listen and res respond to it. Um, so the way to do that, there, there are basically three different avenues, and you can do all three. One is in a uh, is in a town oh well, four actually one is in a t what's called a town hall, and a town hall or those events usually at a school or an auditorium or or a recreation center in which the elected official has the hall. They put out notices for the public to show up. Uh, you, sh you for that you sh you you call the district office or, or their office and you ask them when are your next town halls, and you pick one and you go to it. it, it it's always better if you go with. If you have two or three people going together, but it doesn't have to be, you can go by yourself. So that's called a town hall. The town hall, what happens is the elected official makes some preliminary comments and then um, takes questions. So you want to, you don't want to be the first question, but you want to be the, the in the in the first three uh, because p other people will have have something to say, and you want to be sure that you get uh, you, you get focused. You don't want to be the first question because it it makes you look too eager. Uh, so you want to be somewhere in about third, uh, the third question or something like that. Just raise your hand, stand up, and uh, tell them tell them what what's on on your mind. Uh, the the flip side to a town hall, and I call the Rotary Club. So elected officials will speak to all kinds of civic organizations, Rotary clubs, of uh, 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 PTAs, uh, school, all kinds of situations. So again, ask the district office, ask their their office, do you have any public meetings coming up that I can that I can attend as a guest, and they. They either will or they won't, and they'll either tell you they won't, or it'll, it'll be on the website. The third way is you literally can make an introduction to the to the office, to the staff director of the office, uh, and ask if you can visit with the congressman. I'm just taking this would be a congressman, also could be a city council. If we can, you can visit with them for about 15 minutes in their office. Just say I have some issues on disability issues. I want to share, and oftentimes they will they will they will set up a time. For you to come in and and, t and say your piece, and you just go in, and you have about 15 minutes, um, uh, sometimes 30, but you should plan on about 15 minutes. Just say what say what's on your mind. And the third way is a campaign event uh, when they're running for uh, running for either running for election or running for re-election. And I'm going to put that off for a minute and come back to how to to how to do that. Uh, so what you do is you get there early. You uh, you you want to get to the event 15 minutes in advance. Find a place to sit. Don't sit in the back. Um, you don't have to sit on the front row, but sit somewhere in the center, in the uh, uh, so so it's easier to see you. And in the in the first two or three rows, um, and, and then when the congressman or the councilman says, "Okay, any questions?" Um, then you basically, uh, in a very friendly way, you ask a question. Try to make it a general question that they can that they can that they can answer. You know, don't don't. You don't want to say, how do you stand on H.R. 2222, because that will embarrass them. They may not know what H.R. 2222 is. Uh, but just ask them some general, generalized questions on what is, your, what is your view about jobs for people with disabilities. And then at that point, you can also express your view on what ought to be done better or different for the, on, on that issue. You got about 30 seconds to ask the question, no more than that. Um, really, if you can ask a question in 15 seconds, that's even better. You usually don't get a chance to ask a follow-up question, um, although sometimes the congressman will say, uh, "Explain that to me," or "What do you suggest?" In other words, you you can sometimes you can get a dialogue going, uh, but you don't want to dominate it because there are other people in the audience that uh, are waiting to get their their question in. Listen to the answer. Don't 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 write it down while they're talking, but just listen carefully to the answer, and then uh, and then write down some notes as to what what they said and then after the meeting go and you you will see somebody on the congressman's staff or councilman or school board members somebody is staff uh, they'll be the ones that will be scurrying around setting things up and walk up and introduce yourself to say are you the are you you work for the congressman yes and then try to get his business card and give your card okay 
and that way you have some contact information. And also you can then follow up with an email to the staff member to say, I want to, I want to emphasize what I said at the meeting. So that kind of nails it down. Now you want to do this in a, in a non-confrontational way, in a friendly way. You do not want to assume, regardless of what you may think or may know to be true about the congressman's voting record, you don't want to assume that he's he's against you. You just want to you 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 want to treat it as a blank slate. So you're trying to educate, you're trying to inform, and you, you just assume goodwill on their part. Uh, and uh, and there will be goodwill. So you you don't have, whether or not they vote the way you want them to is is a lot of different factors that goes into it. So assume goodwill, your job is to educate. Then we move from there to a campaign event. So a campaign event is currency of the realm. That's where members of Congress, you, the best kind of campaign event is a what's called a campaign coffee, where someone will host the congressman in their home and invite their neighbors. So you, you, you call the campaign office for those and you say, I want to attend a campaign event. Do you have one coming up? Uh, uh, not a fundraiser. You don't have to pay money. Just say, do you have one coming up? Most of them do. Uh, and if not, then that's their loss. But then go to the event and do exactly the same thing, except it'll be more of a social occasion. And they'll stand around and talk for a little while uh, informally before the, before, the, before the speech and then the questions. You'll also get to ask a question. I would encourage you to do both. A campaign event, the, you'll find the congressman is more relaxed. He or she will, will know that they're among friends and uh, will be more inclined to listen. So you actually want to do, uh, want to do both. Uh, we've talked about what to advocate, and respectability will send you information. Um, it needs to be uh, – you don't want it to be too specific, but you don't want it to be too general. But have a pretty good idea as to what, what, what you want them to do. Uh, as a result of the of the conversation, uh, make it personal. If you then have a chance to give a 15 or 20 second version of your story, how you got where you are, uh, what you've done in your life that is significant, especially on the independence level, uh, that makes it personal. And that and that really helps. And then after the meeting, uh, please uh, report in. Send uh, send send respectability a report on who you talk to. Send the staff member that you that you that you talk to the business card, uh, what you said and what the congressman said, uh, and that gives us a lot of information that we can use on on the national uh, level. It's fun. Uh, you you will be you'll be exhilarated of the involvement, and you 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 and you will make a huge difference in the way they in the way they think. So thank you in advance, and uh, you're, you're going to really enjoy this. All right then. Well, <clears throat> sorry for the little bit of delay, but <clears throat> I think those were words of wisdom that were well worth waiting for. Um, to add to that, you know, Congress, uh, former Congressman Bartlett was really speaking from his perspective as someone who had been a member of the legislative branch at the federal level and a local um, member of a city, a local overseer of a city council. Um, but a lot of the same essential principles of going to campaign events, talking to staff, um, being respectful, asking good questions, and being prepared really apply when it comes to talking to the governor of your state. Um, on our slide here today, you'll actually see a couple slides of some um, fix, pictures of respectability and our uh, affiliated organizations speaking to a bunch of governors across the ideological spectrum. Um, I've had the pleasure of working for respectability for the last three years, and uh, as an organization, we have met with 46 of America's governors. However, this year is really important. With the midterms coming up, there's going to be a lot of turnovers at the governor, in the governor's mansions at the state level. So there's a chance now to close out high with some of the governors who have been great partners of ours, such as Governor Dayton in Minnesota um, or Governor Haslam in Tennessee, who are term limited. Um, but there's a chance in the months ahead to have an impact on some new governors as well. So the essential principle um, is really that you know we work with anyone and everyone. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, um, and for anyone who is interested in working with us and interested in uh, helping our work, um, we ask for you to make the same nonpartisan commitment. Um, it's I'll be honest with you, damn tough these days to you know work with everyone, and you know sometimes you got to hold your nose and take a meeting with somebody you really don't like. Um, but you know what? You got to do that if you want to talk to everyone if you want to have an impact because there are some deep red states where there are people with disabilities living in, um, you know, needing work just as the same and there's blue states as well. 
Um, and so we're really um, going to talk through how do you do this, how do we do this, what can you do, how can we help you, how we can work together um, to really drive this forward. So the first and essential idea to really take it on board is that governors are our partners. Um, the governors work for the people of their state. Um, thinking about it this way, I know it doesn't feel like it all the time, but you know what? Public officials are employed by the people. Um, a, a governor is chosen by the people of his state to, or her state to lead, to direct, to change policy, to change practices, to try and make this state a better place to live and to grow and to change. And uh, We need to be able to work with them as partners to drive opportunities for people with disabilities. Um, governors have tremendous choice. I mean, the phrase you'll often hear is that the states are the laboratory of democracy. Each state is very different, whether it's talking about its economy, its population. Each state from um, tiny states like Rhode Island or Connecticut to massive states like Conne uh, Texas or California all have a lot of issues, a lot of challenges, and there's a lot of great work that can be done regardless of whether it's a tiny state, a big state, or a lot of the small state, uh, mid-sized states in the middle. Um, as I mentioned, we've met with 46 governors, and I'm going to talk you through how we do that, what we do, how to talk through it, and how you can help us with our work. So, so next slide. So there's a couple of very specific things that we want governors to do. I mentioned October, and I'm going to talk about that shortly. So first and foremost, the great thing that we would really love for our folks who are interested in volunteering to help us with is getting governors to put out public proclamations for National Disability Employment Awareness Month, NDEAM for short. We'll talk about that more in a second. Second, we're really hoping that we can get respectability volunteers to sit down and meet with governors and their staff, probably their staff if we're going to be honest, to talk about jobs for people with disabilities. Lastly, we want governors to do press events at programs that are promoting competitive integrated employment, projects that are supporting uh, the success of young people with disabilities. And why that's important is governors go somewhere, they bring press with them. And if press is, goes to a place where people are getting training, they're getting experience, and they're getting into the workforce, that's going to change people's minds. Um, as I said, at the bottom, our bottom line issue is we want governors who are going to become champions on jobs for people with disabilities. And you don't have to be a Republican or a Democrat to be a champion for jobs. You just have to be a governor and be willing and interested in changing how some things work. Um, so take, taking back a second, um, I mentioned something, NDEAM. What is an NDEAM? Well, NDEAM is short for National Disability Employment Awareness Month. So N-D-E-A-M. Launched in 1945, it's a yearly celebration that really focuses on the um, raising the awareness of opportunities for people with disabilities as well as the incredible contributions that people with disabilities make in the workplace. Uh, the theme this year is really great. It's about America's workforce empowering all. Um, you can go to a website called ODEP, that's the Office of Disability Employment Policy, dol.gov has a lot of great resources. They have social media information, they have posters, they have flyers, they have um, a, just a lot of tools to get the message out there. And the message is important because, you know what, message repetition is how you get people to change their minds. People um, need to hear over and over again that critical message that people with disabilities want to work, that they can work, and that they can be incredible employees that will benefit the bottom line. Um, on the picture, um, on the slide I have up right now, it's a picture from the pro poster board for NDEAM. It's got a bunch of diverse people sitting around a conference room working on a project together with a bunch of laptops. And you know what? One of them is actually a power wheelchair user. And that's the kind of mess image that we need to see over and over again. Um, there's great public awareness campaigns in states like South Dakota um, that really are getting that message out there. But you know what? We've got a lot of work to do. Um, I mentioned proclamations, and so what does a meaningless piece of paper have to do with getting more jobs for people with disabilities? You know, I want you to reframe that. It really isn't a meaningless piece of paper. There's a couple of things that getting a proclamation from your governor does, and this is important, so hear me out on this. So first and foremost, if a governor actually, if a governor and their staff take the time to put a piece of paper to sign their signature on it and put the seal of their state on it, it means it's a public commitment. They're committing to work on disability employment issues. Secondly, it also tells the public that, you know what, the governor is actually interested in these things. And that's important because people with disabilities are our loved ones, they are our friends, our family, they are in every community across our country. And everyone deserves to know that our public officials are actually committed to working on our issues and working to help more people get jobs, um, to be able to live independently and to really achieve their dreams. Um, lastly, governors who are doing good work deserve public credit. I mean, 
governors are, you know, they're public officials. They need to get their name in the papers. And they need to get good press. And if a governor is doing the right thing when it comes to jobs with people with disabilities, they deserve good press. Um, if they're not doing the right things, don't worry yet. That's a chance to change their mind. It's a chance to really impact things and, you know, have an impact. Um, as I said, the great thing is if we're able to get proclamations, we got 26 last year, we're aiming to get more this time, uh, and if we get proclamations, it's also a way of holding people to accountable. I mean, public officials, you know, if they put something out on the record, if they, what they say is important, but as Steve Bartlett also said, what they don't say is also just as important. So if a governor doesn't put something out, then it's an opportunity to really raise their awareness and to change their minds. Um, on the slide now, I've got a huge wall of tiny little text um, which actually has the sample language we would love to see from a governor. Now, additionally, a lot of states require that a state resident be the one to request a proclamation. So we've done our work, and I'll talk a bit about it more, but we're going to need state partners in great places to go out there and fill out the forms and ask governors to do stuff. It's just as a sample of the type of language we would love to see coming out from governor's mansions across the country. Our, you know, things like our nation was founded on the principle that anyone who works hard can, should be able to get ahead in life. People with disabilities deserve equal opportunity to earn an income and achieve independence just like anyone else. Whereas, people with disabilities bring unique characteristics and talents to the workplace. People with disabilities can work in hospitals, hotels, apply their talents to develop, develop computer software. There are no limits to what they can do. And these messages are so important. These messages can get people to change their minds. And that's why you'll see those, that phrasing around several times during the course of the rest of this presentation. Um, so next up, We've already done the hard part. So um, I'm here in our office in uh, Washington, D.C., and I'm looking at the team of fellows who are working for respectability this semester. And a couple weeks ago, they were primping and crimping and um, pasting together actual hard copy letters to every single governor's office, um, as well as digital copies that went out later, to request that a governor put out a proclamation for the National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Um, so now that we've done the hard work of getting the lists together, getting the materials, getting it sent out there, we're hoping that you, our friends and family across the country, can actually step up and call governors or maybe meet them in person. Um, just as a quick update on where we are, we have a bunch of states that have gotten back to us with proclamations. My desk has a bunch of very official looking documents from the great states of Virginia, South Dakota, West Virginia, South Carolina, Wisconsin, um, Louisiana, and South, I think I said South Dakota already, but we've gotten a couple states back, and that's great. We're very excited. Um, we'll check our social media channels at Twitter and Facebook. As you'll see, we'll be doing more detailed press releases as we get information and stuff out there from the, uh, the nation. So keep, keep an eye out there and please share. So what do you need to know? So say you, you're really interested in this, you're really excited. So what do you need to know? Well, there's a couple of key pieces of information that we hope you will know and you'll be ready to talk about. And there's several key statistics that you can all find on our website. So first and foremost, you need to know how many working age people with disabilities are living in your state. Working age is important because, again, we're really interested in folks who can potentially be in the workforce, maybe need assistance to overcome a barrier to employment, and so that statistic is very important. Secondly, it's also important to talk about how many people have jobs as it is, that's people with disabilities, because you know that percentage tells you kind of roughly how the state's doing. Um, also important is something very important that we track at respectability is year to year the job gains or the job losses in a state. So what we do is we take the number of people with disabilities employed in one year and then compare it to the new year's statistics. And a little bit of um, a little bit of subtraction and addition, we know how many people got jobs that this past year, which as I said nationally is 343,000. To dig into that specifically. Florida actually had the best um, job growth for people with disabilities of any state in the past year. 35,000 people with disabilities entered Florida's workforce last year. That is a tremendous number. It's a great sign of uh, change and the sign of the times, and we want to see more and more states getting those numbers up. And so you can find all of that on our website at respectability.org. So as an example of some of the statistics that you can find to help your advocacy work, here we've got a page with some very um, a large, long string of numbers for the great state of Maryland. Um, on the left, you'll see a picture of Governor Larry Hogan, who is in the midst of a gubernatorial election this year, um, but he's been working on these issues pretty steadily over his time. He signed some legislation. Um, he's done some 
<clears throat> work, and we're very excited um, to see you know whether he wins or loses in the fall, and continue working working with him if he wins, or working with his um, challenger if he wins instead. But importantly, the numbers you kind of want to focus on are the number of people with disabilities who are working age, in this case 321,000, um, as well as the employment rate, which is 40%, which is above the national average, but not quite where we want to see Maryland to be. And so if you have these numbers together, you're prepared, you can kind of go off of our talking points. Um, this slide has a lot of tiny little font again, but again, for every single state in the country, we have a couple things for you. We have statistics, we have policy recommendations. So we already have basically the ready-made tools that you need to be able to get them in front of people who are gonna make these important decisions. Next up, well, okay, so you're ready, you've listened to this webinar, you're super excited to fight stigmas and advance opportunities. Well, what do you actually do? Um, and who do you talk to? So there's a couple of key people that you'll need to reach out to, uh, you know, coordinating with respectability staff. So when you reach out to the governor's office, you know, you as a member of the public are not getting their personal email. Sorry. Hopefully you'll get a good relationship going, but let's just be realistic here to start with. Um, so you need to talk to their team. And there's several people from the team of the governor you need to reach out to if you're going to try and get an in-person meeting. Um, the first and most important person is something called a scheduler. So the scheduler is also known as the gatekeeper. Um, it sounds like an innocuous job, but it is so important. And pardon me, there, if there is anyone you don't want to get angry at you, it's the scheduler, because they control the scheduler, they control the schedule, they control the governor's time, and they have tremendous power to, you know, bar you from talking to your public officials. Um, Additionally, we want to reach out to the communications director. You can find them on pretty much any press release that comes out of your governor's office. Um, you'll have a seat name and a phone number and an email. Keep that in mind, and those are some of the people you're going to want to reach out to. Um, I will note that some of the really big states, like Pennsylvania, Texas, and California, have specific staff members on the governor's websites that work on proclamations, so you might need to do your research first and foremost. Um, however, we actually have in the media, uh, in the shared files for today's webinar, we have um, contact lists that you can download. So it's the Excel spreadsheet that says Governor Contacts 2018. Download that and you'll find the con communications director, the chief of staff, the uh, scheduler, uh, as well as kind of information about where you can submit information and resources. Likewise, in the shared files, you'll also find uh, a digital copy of the letter that we send out to all of the governor's offices. So if you're interested in moving this forward, download those files and you'll be ready to go. So, now that you know who to talk to, what do you need to say? Well, what you've got here is a picture of what we call a message triangle. Um, there's a, whenever you make kind of a message or you reach out for a request for a meeting, you really want to repeat the key messages you want done and the key action items you want to follow. So in this case, we've got some of that language we talked about. So first and foremost, the idea that our nation was founded on the principle that anyone who works hard wants to, should be able to get ahead in life and that people with disabilities deserve equal opportunity just like anyone else. That message is important because regardless of whether you're a Republican or Democrat, all governors want to be the jobs governor. And regardless of your politics, you've got a commitment to try and make your state better. So that hits that point. Secondly, it's important to talk about best practices. So that's why we have as a message that companies like Walgreens, EY, and AMC have shown that employees with disabilities are loyal, successful, and can help them make money. Um, additionally, government policies that help people with disabilities get jobs can be a win-win-win. That's an idea that's very important because there's a lot of stuff going on, um, whether we're talking about HCPS rules, Medicaid, um, apprenticeship programs, job programs, transition programs. But you know what? There needs to be a serious commitment to programs that work and programs that will successfully impact job opportunities for people with disabilities. So before you, when you're ready to send that meeting request, get your message triangle together, use our language, prepare the template, and go from there. So. You email the governor's office, the, you know, you may get a, you're probably going to get a response, oh, well, the governor's really busy, would you be okay with meeting a staff member? That is fantastic, because guess what? They're the ones who do all the work while the governors get all the credit at the public events. Um, and it's important, as um, Steve Bartlett said, you know, if you build a relationship with a member of a public official staff, they're gonna, you work with them, you provide them what they need, you build that rapport, you build that personal connection, which is going to ultimately translate into results. Um, so if you do get a meeting, um, with a staff member, or you're lucky enough to get a member, an actual meeting with a governor, um, there's a couple of kind of basic things you got to remember. Dress professionally. Um, you know, this is politics we're talking about. It is a suit and tie game. Secondly, be on time. 
Um, and by being on time, I mean get there 10 minutes early, okay? Um, and then remember, always be polite. That's really important, especially given just kind of the toxicity of politics these days. Um, if you're quiet and you're humble and you, you know, very clearly articulate your feelings um, and the key principles and facts, that's going to resonate, you know, a lot more than necessarily screaming and shouting. Now, I will say there is a time and a place when it comes to disability rights for screaming and shouting. Let me let us never doubt that. But in our case, kind of our effort and our approach is the idea of that, you know, polite, respectful, but you know, firm communication is going to get the day. Um, so if you, you know, have done all this, you actually are scheduled to do a meeting with a staff member or a governor, let respectability staff know. Please contact us because we will be very excited to do some practice with you. Just like you wouldn't want to go into an interview without practicing, you don't want to go to one of these meetings without kind of gaming out what you're going to say and what might be some of the responses you might get. You actually go to sit down with a, you know, a governor or their staff. Um, I always want you to keep in mind what I call the 30-second rule, which is something that Steve Bartlett taught to me. So what is the 30-second rule? Um, if at all possible, when you sit down for a meeting, try and make sure you're inside of a clock. And here's why you do that, is because, again, it's all about building that personal connection, that personal relation. Um, and so what I want you to do, any advocacy meeting you go into, take the first 30 seconds, and I want you to actually time it. Take the first 30 seconds and be personable. And I say this as an introvert, and it's kind of like pulling teeth, but make small talk. Talk about the weather. Talk about sports if you're a sports fan. Um, try and sound them out. Maybe talk about a movie. You know, the idea is you want to build that personal rapport, but as soon as the clock hits that 30-second mark, get down to business. Say, so great talking to you. I'm glad we've been able to connect. I want to talk about business. I want to talk about the fact that people with disabilities want to work. Um, that time, it builds the personal connection, but then it really drives to you're being respectful by being on time, by being focused, by getting your point across. So you've done all that, um, what do you do after? So you make your points, you make your ask, you say, I want Governor X to visit a project search site. I want Governor Y to go talk to his workforce board about jobs for people with disabilities. So you've made your ask, what do you do next? Well, the first intermediate step between leaving the office and what you do as a follow-up is your leave behind. So what the heck is a leave behind? So a leave behind is a packet of key information that you want the public official to take um, back. So for example, any governor meeting I go to, I always have a flyer about respectability, I have state-specific statistics, I have a short summary of key best practices and recommendations that we want that governor to follow. Um, I really recommend using kind of a, a neutral black binder, um, and that way your files look prepared, professional, you can include a little business card. Um, we don't have the resources to be able to mail hard copy to all 50 states. But if you're actually preparing for one of these meetings, we'll be more than happy to provide you the digital copies of the statistics, the flyers, whatever you need to be able to make the point across. Um, and the leave behinds are important because at the end of the day, um, that helps reiterate what you want to do. Um, and it's just very much the custom. There's a lot of custom and kind of just form built into what you do when it comes to talking to a public official. Um, so even if you're going to, say, Capitol Hill and doing Capitol Hill briefings, um, you want to have your leave behind, and it's kind of that lasting impression you leave in a public official's office. Remember how I talked about how um, particularly governors want good press and they want to get their name in the papers? Well, um, if you actually get a sit-down meeting, take a picture. That's so important. Social media is an important part of social of advocacy these days. And so on this slide, you have pictures of respectability staff meeting with Republican and Democrat governors. Um, you know, and it goes for your file. Um, you know, you can kind of have a trophy wall of all the different governors that you talk to, or maybe that's just the policy director at Respectability has that. Um, behind me in the conference room, we've got pictures of all the different public officials that our team has met with. Um, that's important because it keeps you, it gives you a memory, it gives you a keepsake, it gives you something you can share. It gives you something you can share on Twitter, for example. Um, also, it gives you an excuse to follow up with whoever you met with. Um, there we go. Um, so, how do you follow up? Well, you've got your picture, you thank the governor, you firmly shake their hand, his or her hand, you know, what do you do next? I'd recommend, if you use Twitter, great. Um, take that picture, tag the governor, um, and then thank them for their commitment to jobs for people with disabilities. Say it doesn't, the meeting doesn't go well, and they say, well, I'm still going to cut government, I'm going to still cut these programs, I don't care. Then you thank them for their time, because again, be polite, be respectful, make your point across.
Um, by the next business day, if you meet with a staffer or you meet with anyone else, make sure to send them a thank you email. Say, so great getting to talk to you. I appreciate this first dialogue. We'll be happy to follow up and provide any information that you promised that you provide but you didn't. Um, and then if you want to be really fancy, um, send actually an old-fashioned thank you letter in the mail. I cannot tell you how what a positive impression that makes these days, considering how much crap gets done by email. Actually getting a letter from somebody you met with is actually a really classy, really impressive thing to do. And it's the cost of a stamp and a piece of paper. Um, so again, you know, when you do that thank you note, you want to stay on message and want to stay positive. You want to reiterate those key ideas that our nation was founded on the principle that anyone who works hard should be able to get ahead in life. Companies like Walgreens, EY, AMC, and so many others are showing that employees with disabilities can be successful. Um, and the idea that government policies which help people get jobs are a win-win-win. Again, it's that message repetition that's so important. Um, so that's kind of the governor's piece, but that's not the only way that you can get involved with respectability's efforts around National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Whoop, got to go back. <clears throat> so we already just did, we just did a webinar about this last week, and I'd encourage you to go to our website and watch that webinar. That's a little bit of a recreation of the McLaughlin Group show um, with Clarence Page and Eleanor Clift talking about how do you write effective op-eds about these issues. Um, it's about telling stories, it's about personal connections. We really are encouraging anyone and everyone who's interested in the issue of jobs for people with disabilities to take this news hook, to take the chance, um, submit an op-ed to your local paper. You know, you write 500 words about the story about how you've struggled to get your son a job and how you've been successful, that's going to get in the paper. That's going to share a story. It's going to get that message out there. Um, if you're really interested in signing an op-ed, um, don't just pen something without us. Let us know. My team here has templates for all 50 states. You can customize and adapt, fill in your story, and it'll have those key statistics you need to have an impact. Um, again, check out our website. Go to the web webinars page on Respectability's website. Um, you can watch that um, web great webinar, and it'll get you ready to go um, for National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Next, there's another different uh, advocacy opportunity I'd love you to follow up with. Uh, so we talk a lot about workforce development, um, and that's the workforce system is the system of state entities that control federal money to support job training programs, especially for people with barriers to work, such as people with disabilities. So every state has something called a workforce board. So a workforce board specifically sees how federal money spent on training programs gets invested. It's a really important agency. It's a really, every single state has one. There are state workforce boards. There are also local workforce boards. And so we seriously encourage you to look up your state's workforce board your, or your local board, find out when they're meeting, um, because they are public meetings and there may be a chance for you to provide testimony. Find out when those meetings are and attend a meeting. That way you'll get a sense of, you know, where are the programs, where are the investments being made, and where are some, where are some changes that can, be, that can happen. So we really encourage you to do that. Um, our great friends over the National Association of Workforce Boards keeps a running tally of state and local boards. You'll see that web link at workforceinvestments.com. We encourage you to go out, check that out, and, you know, maybe you're not ready to meet with a governor one-on-one. Maybe you're not comfortable writing an op-ed, but... Go to a workforce board meeting, take some notes, and send it to me. I'd love to know, for example, what the Wisconsin State Workforce Board is doing next month, um, but I can't physically be there. You, as a potential respectability volunteer, can be. And so we hope you will be the eyes and ears of our work moving forward. So I've been talking a lot. You've listened and listening a lot. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, now is the time where we can have some questions and answers. Um, I'm also going to call on the folks in the conference room here at Respectability for your questions and answers. Um, but first, Operator Luke, can you explain how to ask a question for our audience members? Certainly, Philip. Thank you. Hello, everyone. If you have dialed in and would like to ask a question, please press seven pound on your phone now and you will be placed in the queue in the order received. Listen for your name to be announced and ask your question when prompted. You can also send questions using the Q&A window located on the lower left of the presentation. Just type your message and press ask to send it. Thank you. So, any questions from my live audience? Ms. Uh, no one yet, Philip. I will okay. let you know. 
Oh, sorry. Go Thank ahead. You. So. so there's a lot of talk about outreach to our state officials. So would it be beneficial to reach out to someone on the national level, like our representative in the House or the Senate? That would actually that would be one absolutely wonderful. Um, our our organization's kind of highest priority is um, specifically governors and other state officials, but we would absolutely love to see members of Congress also doing something for NDEAM. Um, what you could easily do is take that workforce board letter and write it, write it, rewrite it and send it to your local representative, say maybe your local congressman, your, lo your state senator. We would be delighted if you took that extra initiative and did that. Um, I know, for example, here in Maryland, um, Senator Van Hollen is really on board with disability issues. Um, likewise, you know, others like Representative uh, Brad Sherman, Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, they're all doing other things for the month. Uh, but you know, again, if you're a constituent locally, that's going to have an even bigger impact than say some national group pestering, you know, members of Congress, uh, because there are a lot of respect, a lot of disability groups at the national level asking members of Congress to do stuff. So a local constituent letter, a local constituent request might have a bigger impact. So thank you. Are office more or less designed to build uh, grassroots momentum, or are they aimed towards uh, public officials who might be reading that newspaper? I would say both. So we had a question from the folks here in our conference room about really is op-ed about more about public officials and changing their mind or getting grassroots support. It really is both. Um, and op-ed really, it's a chance to kind of repeat that message as I talked about before. Um, we're hopeful that, that, you know, say a public official would read their local paper, thumb through to the opinion section, and it's like, oh, it's an op-ed, I never thought about that. Um, likewise, we also want, you know, the chance that, you know, maybe a local employer is going to read through that and say, well, maybe I never thought about it, and maybe it's something I can do. So there's a lot of purposes behind kind of the op-ed idea and the op-ed campaign. Um, Getting something published is also always, you know, a great feeling for, say, a self-advocate, um, and it's always something that can be readily recycled across, say, social media. Yes? Would it be better to just post it generally in social media or to directly at them on Twitter or um, to um, try to get your direct contact? That was a great question. Um, I'm not sure if our caption has heard it, but, um, you know, so in terms of social media, do you want to try and add it um, at somebody? And I would say yes. Um, I mentioned that if you actually have a sit-down meeting with a public official um, and you get a picture um, and you use Twitter, after that meeting, find them on Twitter, tag them in it, um, and thank them for what they're doing. Likewise, if a proclamation comes out, again, you know, there's a good chance that maybe their communications team will pick up the tweet and retweet it because that would be great and a great thing to share. So, Luke, anybody by phone? No one uh, raising your hands yet, Philip. But uh, as a reminder, press seven pound and we will open your line. Go ahead, please. Thank you. That is wonderful, and I don't think our caption has picked that up. Um, but from one of my policy team here, there's a great comment about Facebook. I talk a lot about Twitter because I use Twitter more personally, um, but Facebook has this really great thing where you can search by zip code, and it will tell you who your local officials are and um, help you get in touch with them. So that's a great thing, another great avenue to get that message out there. So thank you for sharing that. All right, last call. Anybody for the chat box? Anybody for the phone questions? Going once, going twice. All right, well, I must have uh, stunned everyone into silence, but um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is such important work, and there is so much work to be done um, when it comes to advancing the opportunities for people with disabilities, especially at the state level. Uh, you'll find a lot, we go, we'll tell you over and over again, go to our website, go to our website. You'll find everything and anything you could ever want, whether it's resources for job seekers with disabilities themselves, adv advice, ideas, information about advocacy and other materials. Um, we also have an extensive new Spanish language resource page on our website, which is a first new thing for us, and it's really great to be able to reach more and more diverse audiences. Likewise, there's a lot of great data sources out there, all linked to our website. We would highly encourage you to go out there and do that. Additionally, so you are so on fire, you're so excited, what do you do next? Well, again, it goes back to, oh, actually I have a last minute question for the chat box. Ah, that's a great question. Um, sorry to 
check gears. But Anthony, thank you so much for asking. So what role, if any, do state vocational rehabilitation agencies play in ending? Well, that really depends on the state agency. Um, many are going to do something special. Maybe they'll host a local event, um, put out materials on social media, maybe do some post poster boards, or maybe do some tele PSAs. Um, it really depends. Um, it really depends on the state. Um, you know, some voc rehab agencies don't have kind of a budget for public-facing advocacy or awareness materials. Others are going to be more focused on really kind of convening a local event. Um, that's all great. It really depends. I would say you want to know what to do. There's two places to go. One at the kind of nationally, there's something called CSAVR, which is the another acronym. I'm sorry. Um, it's the Coalition of State Administrators on Vocational Rehabilitation. They're the national group that coordinates all voc rehab stuff. They've got some great events coming up um, here in D.C., but they have materials for hosting local events. Check them out. It's uh, just Google CSAVR. Additionally, I would say go back to that search engine, search for you know your state voc rehab events and deem. You'll be able to find stuff. You know, and again, it really depends. Some voc rehab agencies have enough flexibility that they're going to do spectacular events in public awareness campaigns. For example, um, in South Dakota, there's a really great awareness campaign called Ability for Hire. I would say everyone check them out. However, they've allocated a budget for social media and um, television ads. Other states don't have that flexibility, so it really depends. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you for your last-minute question. I'm delighted to have answered it. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, to close out, how do you get involved? What do you do? How do you report? All the important things. So we have a tremendous um, director of community outreach and impact by the name of Debbie Fink. She is our go-to person for people who want to do stuff, who want to help us, um, who are working on our issues. Um, her email is debbief at respectability.org. You can call our office at 202-517-6272. Um, get in touch with us. You can reach out to us. You can find us on social media. You can find us on email. Get in touch with us. Talk to us about what you're going to do. Uh, tell us what you can do. We can help you. We can answer any questions you have. Um, and that kind of wraps up everything. And um, everyone wanted to talk to you today. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Steve Bartlett, for joining us via previously recorded audio. Uh, to our audience members, um, good night, good luck, and we will be in touch very soon.